and testimony from people, but he's writing these down and he's combining it all for Theophilus. Um, the last pa part of that uh, passage takes place in verse, uh, verse 6. Uh, talks about in Acts 1, 4 through 5, uh, Jesus, they were uh, told them to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So he instructed them before what happened at the end of that passage, and that is in 6 through 11 of chapter 1. It talks about the ascension. Jesus ascended into heaven. Uh, let me just read that for you. Uh, verses 6 through 11. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it that this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, so this is before the ascension, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, he <coughs> heard two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into the heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into the heaven. So he not only in that passage <coughs> speaks to them prior to his ascension, but he the angels announce that he will come again in the same way. And so we get a lot of instruction just in these first few verses of, of Acts. Um, in Acts 1, 12, 14, it talks about the fact that there were 120 waiting in the upper room. So it wasn't just the disciples. And in fact, it included Mary, the mother of Jesus, and it talks about his brothers. And this is really interesting when you stop and look back. There's so many unwritten stories in the scripture that, you're, that I get really curious about. And <clears throat> one in particular was, if you remember in the book of Mark, it talks about when Jesus, his brothers, kind of mocked him. And they said, why don't you go to Jerusalem? <clears throat> you want to, <clears throat> excuse me, you want to minister, why don't you go to Jerusalem? And he says, my time's not yet come. <clears throat> But then he does go. <coughs> Excuse me. And so what happens there is they are mocking him, and something happens between that time and obviously this time. <clears throat> because what you see is James, his half-brother, becoming the leader in the Jerusalem church. <coughs> Excuse me. I suppose I should take my cough medicine today. <coughs> The other thing that the other thing that takes place. The other thing that takes place is during this time is when Peter stands up and he re says, you know, we, we lost Judas, we need to replace him. And they vote, uh, they draw lots, and Matthias is chosen as the uh, one to fill that slot. You gotta understand Matthias and many others were following him at that time. So these 120 were all followers. They were not uh, new folks, new converts to the faith after that time. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. In Acts 2, 1 to 8, the Holy Spirit descends upon them. And this is officially the launching of the church age, because this is the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost marks the beginning the day, the day that marks the end of the church age is the, is the rapture. So this whole period, as I've shared with you before, is really, really special in, in a couple of different ways. Number one, we have the completed scriptures. It wasn't all completed at that time, but we, we had many of them that we'll talk about today came from this period of time in the early church. But today we have the scripture and we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is, I, I share with people, it's the, on, the Bible is the only book that you will ever read where the author is always present. And literally, as I read my Bible, God reveals things over, I mean, I've read this before, and I never saw that. Maybe I've read it dozens of times. And so it's really important, I think, to understand that the beginning of the church age brought the Holy Spirit, the helper, 
Acts 2, 41 and 42 is where Peter preaches his first sermon. And it's impressive. When you read through Acts and you hear the testimony of Peter, and it's interesting, the different sermons of Peter, the different sermons of Paul, for that matter, all will uh, approach their audience from a level that they understand. Whether it's a Jewish audience, a Gentile audience, the Sanhedrin, whoever it is, they custom blend the theology of the Jewish faith in presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. But 3,000, can you imagine a church today with 3,000 being saved in one day? So it was obvious that this was a radical event. It was a radical thing. There had never been 3,000 people at any time in history that had become a part of the Jewish faith. There were people that converted Judaism. In chapter 3, Peter preaches his second sermon. Coming on into chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested and they're taken before the high priest. Ananias and Caiaphas is there. And the Jewish leaders, and they preach the gospel once again, but this time specifically to these Jewish elders and these wise people. And they just were amazed because these are people who they considered uneducated fishermen. Now, as I shared with you before, in the Jewish tradition, every one of these men who were part of Jesus' disciples were not uneducated. They were Jewish. They had gone through Hebrew school. They were, not, they, they were literate, but they weren't rabbis. They had not been trained as rabbis. Now, there's an exception to that. We'll talk about that in a little bit here. Barnabas is first introduced right there at the end of Acts chapter 4. It's just mentioned that he sold the property. His, he gave the money to the disciples. And they had everything in common. In Acts chapter 5, we see a different sort of story. And that's where Ananias and Sapphira sell the property. And they lie to the church about it. And they both drop dead. Uh, not a good uh, example for the rest of the church. Maybe it was. Uh, Gamaliel, though speaks out in verses 34 through 39. And somebody, if we've got a mic, that we can get to somebody, 39 to 34 is where we've got uh, the words of Gamaliel that are really prophetic. Uh, and so if somebody would read that part. Here we go. Acts 5, 34. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thutis appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Very prophetic, and it's interesting. Again, Gamaliel is a famous, uh, among the, the Sanhedrin at that time, he was a prominent teacher, and he predicts that this is something you need to be careful about. Acts chapter 6, they choose deacons because the church is growing so rapidly, they need additional help, and one of the particular deacons that they, they chose at that time was a deacon by the name of Stephen who, again, they weren't just serving the, the uh, widows and the orphans. They were doing other things, and he was preaching. And it's amazing when you read through chapter 7 and chapter 8 of Acts to hear the defense of the gospel that Stephen gives prior to his martyrdom, because then in chapter 8 and 9 is when he's martyred, and Saul begins to assault the believers, pursues them to Damascus, uh, and he's saved along the way. And then he's ministered to by Ananias. Can you imagine Ananias getting the message from God that he's supposed to go meet this guy? This is the guy that's ravaging the church. Uh, people are, are being dispersed. 
And again, the, the, the good news is, by being forcing the believers out of Jerusalem, they went to all parts of the Roman world, places that they thought they'd be safer. The reality is Saul was, was de determined to persecute them because he was, as he refers to himself many times in the book of Acts, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was diligent to the law, excelling everybody else. And so he not only was a Jew, a devout Jew, a Pharisee, he was trained as a rabbi. In fact, I, I have a, a presentation I give called The Rabbi's Rabbi. He is the only one among the disciples that was trained officially as a rabbi. And uh, we'll, we'll learn more about that as we go through this this morning. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, who's a very devout believer, but he's a Gentile, from Caesarea. Now, Caesarea, there are different Caesareas, but Caesarea Maritima is where he's from. And I'll show you some pictures of it later, but Caesarea Maritima sits right on the coast. And this, this was a major military installation. They have a huge hippodrome that they've excavated there. And uh, he was a prominent, devout centurion, a Roman centurion, who had obviously worshipped and gave alms to the uh, uh, god of the, the Jews. And he gets this vision in uh, chapter 10. And the vision that he gets is that he, from an angel that he is to call for this Paul, it's actually Saul, sorry. And he goes to get, he sends people, messengers to go get Saul. And Saul, this is one of those interesting things I've never quite figured out, but Saul is residing, residing in Joppa. Now Joppa is about, I would say, 60 miles south of uh, Caesarea Maritima. And 60 miles south, Joppa is a seacoast city. It's, that's where, that's the city that, if you'll remember when, uh, Jonah was trying to escape his assignment, and he jumped on a ship. That was at Joppa. Joppa is where the timbers came in that were used to build the, the temple from, uh, from the cedars of Lebanon that came down there. They were brought to Joppa, then traveled overland to Jerusalem. So Joppa is still today a busy port city. And Joppa is where Peter, or Saul was, I'm sorry, Peter at the time was residing and he was on the roof, if you remember the story. This is one that I've always wondered about. He was at the home of Simon the Tanner. What's a Jew doing living in the home of a Tanner? I'm not sure how that fits into Jewish purity and all that. But at any rate, he's on the roof. He gets, his, he gets sleepy. He gets this vision of the sheep coming down with the unclean animals. And he sees it three times. And each time, God tells him, take and eat. Well, he's a devout Jewish boy. He's not going to eat these things. So he says, no, no way. But, but God says, whatever I've presented to you, you know, that's what you need to do. Well, about that time, he gets this knock on the door from Cornelius' entourage. And they come and tell him that Cornelius has had this vision. And so he goes with them to Caesarea Maritima. The next day he arrives. He shares the gospel. The whole household is saved. Now there's only four examples in the New Testament, Acts specifically, where the Holy Spirit falls upon people. Uh, some people, uh, some, some uh, what I would call uh, charismatic groups believe that it's a gift that everybody should demonstrate. Maybe it is. I, I certainly wouldn't argue with anybody's experiences. But in the New Testament, there's only four examples where the Holy Spirit fell upon a group of individuals. Number one is when <coughs> the day of Pentecost. Yeah, and it, and every assumption is based on Scripture. What we know is that that Holy Spirit fell upon everyone, including Mary and other women that were with them, not just men. The second time was here. Cornelius is, and his household come to Christ, and guess what? The Holy Spirit falls upon them. Now, Peter, being a good Jewish boy, probably, if he'd not been forced by the Holy Spirit, by God, to go to this Cornelius, this, this Gentile's home, would probably never have darkened the door. you got to understand, there was this huge gap between not only the Jews and the Gentiles, but the Jews and the Samaritans. And so, that's this, this is the second example. And I believe that God uses this as a very direct example or a demonstration of, 
that the Holy Spirit was not just for the Jews, was not just for the devout, Christ, the devout early Christians that were all Jewish. This was the Holy Spirit falling on these. So what does Peter do? Peter says, well, how can we deny them baptism? If the Holy Spirit has baptized them, how can we not baptize them? So they were baptized. So then he goes back to Jerusalem to report to the Jerusalem church what has happened. And so this is a really a huge turning point in the early church, especially for those you know, in our, our audience, they're Gentiles. Because again, this was up until this point, it was really a Jewish sect. But now we've got these Gentile converts coming in. Acts 11 is where Peter brings back this report to Jerusalem. And I think it's really significant because we often see Paul as the, the one who went to the Gentiles. But God used Peter very specifically to demonstrate, hey, this is okay. This is, this is what the Holy Spirit, and this is what my intention is. And so Barnabas and Saul began to teach new believers. That's also shared in, chat, in Acts chapter 11. What's the significance of this? Well, I'm going to ask you a question. How long has Paul been saved at this time, would you guess? Anybody got an idea? Well, somebody, uh, let, me, uh, let me have you turn in your Bible to Galatians. I think this is a really a major misunderstanding that many people have about Paul and his ministry. And again, at this point, he's never called Paul. He's only called Saul. But if you look at um, Galatians 1, 15 to 24, let me read it. But when God had, who had sent me, and this is Paul giving his defense of his ministry, but when God who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, after returning to Damascus, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days, but I did not see any other the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Sicilia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. Bible scholars that I've read from a number of different uh, commentaries believe that the time between his conversion on the road to Damascus and this very first missionary effort that was prompted by Barnabas calling him to Antioch because there were so many Greeks coming to Christ, and, and he knew that Paul was learned. And Paul at this time was living in Tarsus, his old hometown. Now, it doesn't say that he wasn't ministering there, but the fact of the matter is he's really been off the radar for what most uh, Bible uh, theologians believe is 13 to 14 years. Now, the preparation really was not a 13, 14-year preparation. His preparation began, as he says, long before that. From the time he came from his mother's womb, he was being prepared for this. I, uh, as a little kid, when I was seven, eight, nine years old, my parents might go off for the weekend or for, for an evening on a Saturday night. Well, my grandparents lived about two miles away, and so I'd be staying overnight at their place, or at least till late at night. I wouldn't remember when my folks would pick me up. And uh, they had this little, nice little bedroom off right to the edge of the, the living room. Uh, and so they'd leave the door open, you know, so I'd have some light. But the television was sitting right there where I could watch it from the bedroom. And it was either Gunsmoke or it'd be Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And I always liked Alfred Hitchcock. And Alfred Hitchcock is what I called the uh, genius of the paradigm shift. You watch, you watch that show and you get to the end and it's like, what? Well, I didn't see that coming. And so you have to go back and you have to rethink everything. I think Paul had to do that. It took him maybe not a full 13 years, 
But what happened was he went into Arabia, and I believe he says, okay, now let me look at the scripture again. Let me look at his Old Testament scripture. He's memorized as a, as a Jewish rabbi. He's got memorized the first five books of the law. And so he knows the prophecies of the Messiah. He knows all these things. And so he's going to go back, and he's going to rethink everything. And then he's going to compare that with his experience on the Damascus Road and who Jesus is. And he's going to find out what he can about what he knows about Jesus. And he's going to put those things together. He comes back to Damascus, probably ministered there for a period of time, probably interacted with believers there. Three years later, he goes to Jerusalem. He sees James, the brother of the Lord, and he sees Peter. And that's where he gets a little more education. But then he goes back to Tarsus. And every indication is he's working as a tent maker. There's no indication any place that Saul, who he's still known as to, at that point, Saul, 13 years later. We always think of him as Paul, but he wasn't Paul until later. And so he goes back, and now he's called by Barnabas to come to Antioch to begin uh, mission work there and teaching. So I think it's a really interesting, and again, the book of Acts, we don't always pick that uh, all those details up, but it's really important to understand. Okay, in Acts 12, Herod puts uh, John, the brother of James, to death, and he sees that it pleases the Jews, so he arrests Peter. Well, Peter's in jail, and guess what happens? An angel shows up, the chains fall off of him, he walks out of the, the prison, and it's like everybody else is suspended in time, because the next morning when they come to find him, nobody can find him. He's, this is the story where he goes to the, the home where he knows the, the apostles are praying and he knocks on the door. And Rhoda, the, one of the slain girls, comes to the door and she slams the door in his face. She, she, she goes to tell him, you know, he, Peter's at the door. They say, no, it can't be, can't be. Well, he is. And so he prays with them and then he leaves the city. Saul and Barnabas in chapter 13 are called to their first missionary journey by the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know, let's go, let's look in your Bible at verses 12 and 13 in chapter 13 of Acts. Because this is where, on their first missionary journey, this is where Saul becomes Paul. Uh, let, me, let me read this for you. And if between verses 12, in fact, let me back up to verse 9, because you really have to take in verse 9. But, this, but Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him. He's fixing his gaze on, on the magician there, because there's a, a governor by the name of Saulus, Paulus, rather, that wants to hear about the gospel. So when you jump down, in verse 12 it says, Then the proconsul believed... And he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Verse 13, Now Paul and his companions put out to sea with Paphos and came to Pergia and Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. So in verse 13, from that point on in all of Scripture, he's referred to as the Apostle Paul. But prior to that, for 14 years probably at least, he was known as Saul. And again, his reputation was being altered among the Jews, among the new believers, because they saw, they realized that this one that had persecuted the church had been converted and became a powerful minister to the gospel. Okay, here's a major event, again, that affects, has affected every one of us. Again, you got to remember that this was seen as a Jewish sect. It, it exploded in growth after the day of Pentecost. But this is a major event. It's called the, the Council of Jerusalem, and it took place in 50 AD. And it's at this time that Jesus, uh, in, in Acts 15, chapter, verse 1, let me just read it to you quick. In verse 1, it says, Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, wouldn't it be natural, if you were Jewish, person, and you've lived with all these traditions, the dietary laws, you've lived with the, the circumcision, you've lived with all these other uh, the holidays and, and celebrations and feasts, wouldn't it be natural for you to think, okay, Jewish is the, Jesus is a Jew, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, I'm convinced of that, 
So he's the Jewish Messiah, so shouldn't you have to become a Jew in order to accept him? Now we think, you know, we think naturally that, well, why would you need to do that? Well, if it weren't for this event in 50 AD, it may only have been a, 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 a Jewish cult today. But this was a major event. And it's actually in verses 13, 19, and 20 that we see James, the half-brother of Jesus. And again, there's a conversation that took place sometime between the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension between James and his brother Jesus, his half-brother Jesus. Uh, because here's what James says in verse 13. After they had stopped speaking, James answered saying, Brethren, listen to me. Jumping down to verse 19. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols, because they were used to worship idols, there were offerings given to idols, and that they, and the things contaminated by idols from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. And so those are the specific things. So we, now all of a sudden, the dietary laws and all those things that the Jews thought were the essential means to God are now passe. And this was a major thing that opened the door to evangelism of the uh, Gentiles and the expansion of the, of the gospel uh, all over the world. In Acts 16, Paul leaves on his second missionary journey with Silas. He and Barnabas split up. Uh, Barnabas takes Mark, goes another direction. He takes Silas. In this, in chapter 16, Timothy is converted and circumcised. Paul receives a vision from a man in Macedonia. This is a really interesting verse. I want you to turn there. Uh, in uh, verses 16, 6 through 13. Uh, this is a really interesting passage, and I'm just going to read it quick. 6 through 13. And I want you to look at what changes between verses 6 through 9 and 10 and on. They passed through Hergia and Galatia region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Maesia, they were trying to go into Bithynia. And the Spirit of Jesus did not prevent them. And passed by, passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Verse 10. Notice the change. When he had seen the vision, immediately we, thought, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Somoth Race, and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we were staying in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking for the women who had assembled. Do you see the change? Anybody see it? Up until verse 10, it's they, they, they. From verse 10 on, it's we. This is where Luke joins. In fact, some people believe that the vision that, that Paul saw was a vision of Luke asking them to come to Macedonia. At any rate, it's at this point, from this point on, Luke is with Paul the whole time. And so in the book of Acts, this is where Paul and Luke hook up. Acts 24 and 25 Paul is a prisoner in Caesarea Maritima. Now, this is a really interesting passage, and, and again, I'll show you some pictures of Caesarea Maritima because it's a really interesting place to visit today. Uh, Paul's a prisoner in Caesarea Maritima because he had been arrested in Jerusalem, and there was a plot to kill him. <laughs> the Romans became aware of it, and again, he was a Roman citizen. He played that card when he needed to to get some special treatment that other Jews in that day wouldn't have had, maybe. And so what happens is, he is taken by Roman escort to Caesarea Maritima on the coast. And while he's there, he actually spends over two years there uh, in, in prison. Uh, but it, I, I believe he probably had fairly decent accommodations. He was, again, a Roman citizen. He probably got a lot, lot of special treatment. Um, he actually, during this period of time, God really used this because he had an opportunity to speak before three really prominent 
men within the government. There was Felix, Festus, and King Agrippa, and Bernice. And uh, give his defense of the faith in the amphitheater. Do you remember this passage? Do you remember the story? Where King Agrippa says, if you keep talking, you're going to convince me. And he says, I, I wish for you know, everything that except for my change, you would have exactly what I have, meaning faith in Jesus. Um, I want to show you a couple of pictures here. This is an aerial view of the amphitheater in Caesarea Maritima. This was a, a really a, 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 a huge port. It was built to ship out of there, and it was a very teeming port. There's a lot of it's fallen into disrepair now, but this amphitheater is still used. Last time I was there, they were actually set up for a huge rock concert. Uh, but that is the same uh, place that uh, Paul would have given his defense to King Festus. In fact, right here is where the king would have sat, and right here is where Paul would have stood. So I always say, you know, when you go to Israel, you need to get some perspective on things. Number one is, there's good news. And the good news is, there was a woman that we'll talk about next week called Mother Helena. Mother Helena was the mother of Constantine, the emperor. And Mother Helena, when she was in her 70s, late 70s, she could have sat in the lap of luxury in Rome and said, feed me another grape. But instead, she went to the Holy Land. And she spent years there, and even all the way down into Egypt, identifying holy sites that had strong tradition. So the good news is, when you go to Israel, you pretty well know where a lot of these things actually happen. Here's the bad news. They built basilicas over a lot of them. It's pretty hard to kind of envision what it was like. But I always like this place because this is, I know, within a few steps of right there is where Paul would have stood. And right there is where Festus would have sat. Uh, and this is a picture from a couple of years ago. This is our two youngest daughters, Lauren and Brianna. And Patty's sitting up here where the king would have sat. And again, they still use this today. And it's, a, it's amazing. It's been well preserved. There's a huge amount of stuff to see there. In fact, um, Paul was later brought back to Rome during the persecution of Rome. And uh, one of the places that we visited the last time we were in Rome was, was right here. It's called the uh, uh, Maritima Prison. And it's literally, it, you could walk out of there and within a block, you would be in the Colosseum. So it's right close to the Colosseum. So it's really convenient for him to take a prisoner from there over to the Colosseum to be fed to the lions. Uh, and it's actually believed that this was the, the cell where Paul was held. Uh, and there's, they actually use this as a church now. There's actually two churches that meet there uh, on a regular basis. Um, it was just in 2005. This is this is the St. Paul's uh, Basilica on the outside. It's outside of Rome proper, uh, but they actually in 2005 discovered a bone box that was labeled Paul the Apostle, martyr, and uh, he was actually martyred. He was beheaded uh, just yesterday. I, it it came and went from Lincoln so fast that I didn't, know, I didn't know if it was still even showing, but I was able to see this movie yesterday. It's called Paul the Apostle of Christ. It's still shown in Omaha. But it is very, very well done. Uh, Jim Caviezel, uh, who played Christ in The Passion, uh, Mel Gibson's Passion, uh, he plays the part of Luke in this movie. And it's very, very well done. If you get a chance to see it sometime uh, on Amazon or something, do that. So... When were the scriptures recorded? Because this is, we're laying down the, the framework, we're laying down a foundation during the book of Acts and following for the, the early church. So these are all writings beginning, and they're listed here chronologically, and we won't spend a lot of time on them, but James was written about 50 AD. It's, it's one of the very first books of the New Testament. The first, first and second Thessalonians, Galatians, first and second Corinthians. There is actually the third and the fourth Corinthians that didn't make it into the, uh, uh, one was lost, the other one did not make it into the canon. Uh, there's Romans, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians, Luke, and then there's Acts in 64, first Timothy, Titus, second Timothy, Mark, Matthew, Hebrews, first Peter, second Peter, Jude, Apoc the Apoc Apocalypse, uh, John, Epistles of John. The, uh, 
the canon, we'll talk more about that next week when we talk about the definition of theology, the canon of the Bible, and those kind of things we're developing. But it's really interesting. Here, by the time we get out to less than 100 years after the birth of Christ, the canon is pretty well decided. And when you go back and you study it, there's very, very few of the apocryphal books were ever thought to be a part of the Bible. And so the Bible we have today was pretty well decided within 100 years. So literally, it was either by first-hand witnesses that they were written, or by people like Luke, who were shared first-hand witnesses' testimony, is where most of these came from. So what happened to the apostles? We'll wrap up with this today. This is kind of interesting. And this, and again, whenever you get into this kind of thing, it's there's strong traditions, OK? One of the people we'll talk about next week when we talk about the theologians and the people that really defined our faith in those early years is Eusebius. Eusebius was the historian. Eusebius you know, recorded you know, volumes of information about the original, the early church and the early church fathers. And so some of this comes from him, some from others. Well, we all know what happened to Judas. Okay, We're going to talk about what happened with the disciples. Judas uh, went out and hung himself. Uh, and uh, Andrew was a missionary to modern-day Georgia, Bulgaria, the ancient, it's, it's next to the Black Sea. And he was martyred, crucified in the town uh, of Achaia. Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, he was uh, a missionary to India. Uh, and it was interesting. They had, there was a very, very large Jewish population in India, in the southern tip especially of India. And uh, he was martyred, crucified upside down in Armenia, Georgia, and, and uh, buried in al, al -Nun. James, the son of Alphaeus, he, he was a local missionary, stayed in the Jerusalem area. He was martyred when preaching in Jerusalem. He was stoned to death by the Jews uh, and was buried there beside the temple. James, the son of Zebedee, Remember James and John, sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder. He was a local missionary in, in Judea. He was martyred, beheaded in Judea. He was the brother of John uh, from Capernaum, referred to by Jesus as one of the sons of thunder when he was preaching in Judea. And he was killed by Herod, the Tetrarch, and buried there. John, the brother of James, son of Zebedee, was banished to Patmos. He's the one that was the youngest, John the youngest, and he died of old age from Capernaum. Now, there's legend that he was actually... They, they attempted to martyr him, and he survived. And he went on to write the book of Revelation. Matthew, and uh, also known as Levi, he was a missionary to uh, Iran, died of old age. He was a tax collector in Capernaum, son of Alphaeus, possibly James's brother, also known as Levi. Simon Peter, he was a missionary to Galatia, Cappadocia, uh, parts of Italy, Asia. He was martyred and crucified upside down in Rome. In fact, there's tradition, no evidence, biblical or otherwise necessarily, but there's tradition that he also served time in the Mar Mar Mamertine prison in Rome. Don't know that he did, don't know that he didn't, but he was, cru he was crucified in Rome, or outside of Rome, and about the same persecution. It was in, in, in 68, 67, 68 is when Rome... Roman had the huge fire in 64 AD, and Nero blamed the Christians, and he used it as an excuse to, to increase the persecution uh, of the Christians. Phil, uh, Philip, missionary to Turkey, uh, was martyred, crucified upside down in Turkey, uh, and he's from Bethsaida. Number 10, Simon the Zealot. And we talked about the Zealots being the ones that really wanted Jesus to be the commander that would overthrow the Romans. He was a bishop of Jerusalem after James died of old age. Actually, James' uh, half-brother was, tradition has, was stoned as well. Uh, so I, I don't think age had a lot to do with it. I think it was more the stones. Uh, he was from Cana, called Simon the Canaanite, or Simon the Zealot. He was died and was buried in Jerusalem. Thaddeus, or Judas, the son of James, uh, missionary Edisa, and the surrounding uh, area, that would be Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Iran. He died of old age. He may have taken the name Thaddeus, which means warm-hearted, uh, because of the infamy with which the name Judas was uh, associated after Judas betrayed Jesus. Number 12, Thomas. He was a missionary to the Parthenians, uh, which are in Iran, Afghanistan. He was martyred, speared on St. Thomas Mount, 
Um, the, uh, Patty and I have spent quite a bit of time in India, and uh, he's known as a doubting Thomas. But do you remember another time when in Scripture he was the one that was ready to go to die with Jesus? Remember when the, the, he was called uh, because of Lazarus? Lazarus had died, and Jesus delayed coming to him, and he died in the meantime. And when he says, okay, he's gone to sleep, we're going to go now. And the disciples said to Jesus, he says, hey, they're looking for you there. They're going to kill you there. And Thomas is the one that said, hey, if, if he goes, we all die. You know, he was ready to go. So we always remember the doubting Thomas. We don't remember the Thomas that was ready to go to his death with Jesus. Well, it's interesting. If you go to Saint, uh, if you go to Chennai, India, which is on the southern side, Thomas actually went to the south part of India in a state called Kerala. It's on the it's on the western side, so the southwestern side of India. has a very very strong tradition. He planted seven churches there. Then he took a ship and came around to the other side of India, and that's primarily where I've been. And this is on what they call Saint Thomas Mount. It's on a mountain out kind of out on the outskirts of Chennai. And there's, of course, besides this monument, there's a church there, and there's a lot of other things. But if then you go into the city, this is the basilica where he's entombed. And in fact, they have a small museum there, and they actually have the spear tip that supposedly he was speared with four times by a Hindu priest. And, uh, and there's actually the third place that is there that's significant for St. Thomas is a place that we just got to go this last year when we were there. This is a cave that he support, purported to have lived in, in the city of Chennai. It's right in the city of Chennai. And of course, there's a really nice church uh, there now as well as the cave. So what happened to uh, number 13? Because we had to replace Judas, right? So Matthias was the one that we replaced him with. He was a local missionary in Jerusalem. He died at old age. After Jesus' ascension, the 11 apostles met, and they named him the 12th. Well, there was another one. His name's Paul. We'll talk a lot more about him next week. We've talked a lot about him today. But Paul was a missionary to Croatia, Italy, Spain. He was martyred in Rome. Uh, we know that. He became an apostle after the ascension of Christ. And again, he's the only one that was really the rabbi's rabbi. He was trained as a rabbi. And, and because of uh, his influence, we have about half of our New Testament came from him. So of the 14, one was lost, nine were martyred, four became missionaries and stayed in the Jerusalem, Judea area. The rest were foreign missionaries who left their local surroundings and took the gospel to the rest of the world and planted churches wherever they went. So that's our lesson for today. Anybody got any questions before we wrap? Next week we're going to talk about the early church development, how the church fathers, the apostolic fathers, really developed their, their ability to uh, argue with uh, both the, the Jews, but also now the Greeks and the Romans that were open and hearing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we'll talk about uh, also the, the, the documents, not just the canon of the scripture, but we'll talk about those things that help define what a church, what a Christian church looks like, how we talked last week about how it's very similar to the synagogue and its structure and its architecture, everything. But there's some distinct differences between Christians and Jews today. And so we'll talk about those kind of things next week. Uh, I have copies of last week's in the back if you want to pick up on the handouts. And, uh, and uh, we appreciate your attention. Thanks for nobody falling asleep on me. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks.